Greetings and welcome to the Pure Cycle Corporation First Quarter 2021 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Mark Harding. Uh, thank you. I'd like to welcome you all to our first quarter call for fiscal year 2021. Uh, for those of you that have been following the company, um, we typically uh, do fewer calls. We've been typically on a platform where we do a couple calls a year, uh, but I think what we'd like to do is, uh, given the level of interest and the new uh, folks that uh, have been expressing interest in the company, and then really just the quarter over quarter uh, improvements and, and really changes to, not changes, but uh, execution to our business plan. We want to kind of be a little bit more descriptive and a little more uh, timely in these calls. So we're going to get to that traditional four calls a year format for you all. So uh, welcome, and this will be our first call. Uh, well, we did this, uh, I think, last year as well. So we're going to continue that uh, context on that. Um, what I want to do is for those that are on the call itself that haven't already done this, if you can go to our website, uh, on the front page of our website will be a link on the front page that you can click to. We're on a new platform here we're very excited about. It will allow me to be able to actually um, control the deck uh, for our call ourselves so that we can walk this through and then allow me to be able to be descriptive about what our results are. So. Uh, a new platform here. I, I think it's going to. I think it's going to improve the calls. I think it's going to improve the flow of the information for you all. So, uh, if you haven't done it, go ahead and do that. Jump on that uh, purecyclewater.com, and on the home page, you'll see that link up there. So, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, our first slide, as always, is our safe paper statement. So, we'll get the attorneys out of the room and say that. Uh, these this statements are not historical facts, and they're uh, forward-looking statements. And I think you're all familiar with forward-looking statements on that. But um, diving into oh, okay, being uh, told uh, I'll increase my volume here, get a little closer to the microphone. A little bit about PureCycle. For those who are new to the company, uh, we own a portfolio of valuable water rights in the water short uh, Denver, Colorado area. Some of you uh, have, may have seen a recent article in the New York Times about the value of water and value of Colorado water, and uh, it's an opportunity to create value, and we're, we're delighted that uh, more recognition is being given to this resource and the value that this resource has. Um, we have been long on water for more than 30 years uh, and, and also long on how to monetize that water and um, taking a look at not just the utility segment but what water can do for land development, for properties, for industrial customers. And so while I think there's a, there's a very compelling case to be made for the value of water in water short areas, um, it's also uh, an elegant way of being able to monetize that value through a vertical integration. And so we do have uh, not only a utility segment, but also a land development segment that we'll talk a little bit about as well. Um, moving to our next slide, this uh, brief description of kind of the location of our water. Our water is in southeast Denver metropolitan area. Uh, towards the top of that, uh, you see the Sky Ranch project. That's our land interest uh, right up along the interstate. That's Interstate 70 right to the top of that graph there. And there's a little bit of depiction about some of the transmission infrastructure and wells and some of the uh, storage assets that we have. Uh, what's interesting is, um, you know, the, the New York Times really did have a great discussion about the value of water, but it didn't really have much about how to monetize that. You know, there's really several ways that if you, if you look at the broad scheme of how you can monetize water, certainly there are those folks that buy low and sell high. I mean, that's just a, an, uh, an arbitrage where you're going in, buying the value of an asset, waiting for the value of that asset to increase, and then selling that asset. That's certainly a way to monetize it. Uh, you can buy uh, the asset, you can add some infrastructure to it, and then sell it as a monetization. So you're value adding 
in that cycle and, and doing that in addition to allowing time to appreciate the value of an asset is another way to monetize it. Certainly, you can buy the asset, add value, and then uh, provide service, which is a monetization way. So that's kind of the vertically integrated utility portion of the model. Uh, and that's historically a component of what we've been operating under as our utility segment. And then, you know, lastly, you can buy an asset, you can add value, uh, you can provide that service model, and then you can also leverage that. And by that leverage, what we look to do is find opportunities where water increases the value of another asset. And in, in our particular market segment where we happen to own water in a water short region, that opportunity is created through land development. And that's really where the company has focused its energies in most recent uh, years. And so we like that model. We uh, have been executing that model for the last three years. And um, what I'd like to do is tell you whether or not we're doing okay on that. And so uh, as we move through uh, really kind of description of the queue, our land development segment, we picked up a parcel of property probably, you know, at, at the right time. We bought it right in the depth of the, the real estate recession back in 2010. It's a 930-acre uh, parcel of property that was zoned as a fully entitled master plan community. It's a mixed-use master plan community that has a wide range of uh, residential product types, uh, commercial, retail, industrial zoning. So it's a full master plan community can accommodate about 32 to 3,400 residential lots, about 2 million square feet of commercial because we do have an interchange right off the interstate. And that equates out to about another 1,600 equivalent connections for us. And, and we typically look at the world in what it relates to as a lot and what it relates to as a service connection, both in terms of a lot for our land development segment and an SFE service connection for our utility segment. Um, it's in the right location, uh, you know, uh, just east of downtown, four miles south of uh, DIA. So good location uh, with access along the interstate. Um, you know, there's just simply not enough water to serve the land um, in, in the west and particularly in the Denver area. And while water without land continues to hold value, land without water does not. And so what we like is this combination of the land and the water utility segment. With more land and water, um, you know, we've been bringing our water supplies to land that adds value to the land and, and participating in the increase in the value that that water adds to the land and then as well um, adds value to our utility segment. So we'll add customers and we'll add connections by virtue of the land development segment. So we kind of have the best of both worlds of bringing a valuable asset to a valuable asset uh, in, in the scheme of how you're adding the land and the water assets together. Let's take a look at our, our Sky Ranch development. I'll, uh, I'll quickly move through some of these slides because some of those are going to be a recap. But uh, our first phase included uh, 506 lots. So if you look at uh, that first phase, we had 506 lots, three national home builders, put those lots under contract uh, sort of the mid-year 2018, uh, have sold and delivered all those lots. So all 506 lots have been completed and delivered to our home builders. Um, the pace of absorption for uh, development out there has exceeded all expectations, both our expectation as well as the builder forecast. We have about 232 residents out there and about 115 homes under construction, so we're adding about 27 homes, about nine, eight to nine homes per builder per month, so the absorption is terrific out there. And so we're very proud of the first phase, the successes that we've had under the first phase, and really looking to move to our second phase. So our second phase is about twice the size of our first filing. We'll have about 900 total platted lots. Uh, we've contracted for about uh, 790, 789 of those lots. So we kept a few lots in reserve this time um, because we were looking for some options for those uh, other lots. So we'll continue to evaluate the options on what we want to do with those and really update you as, uh, as our plans continue to evolve on those. But we wanted to make sure that we're looking at all our options on how we're adding value to the community and, you know, giving us 
you know, the ability to continue to add to the curb appeal of the community and participate in the benefit of the appreciation of those lots in some strategies. So we'll continue to update you on how we progress with those other lots. But really, if you look at this second phase, it'll look, uh, it'll, it'll be all 900 lots. It's just keeping some options open as to how we can track for the other 100 lots on that. Second phase will be a little more diversified in its product class. Uh, in our first phase, we had really just two options. We had a 45-foot lot and a 50-foot lot. So you had door number one or door number two. Um, in, in the next phase, we have six different product classifications. So you're going to see the, the same continuation of 35 or 45 and 50-foot lots, but then we'll have uh, a lot of other types of paired duplex townhomes, uh, a lot higher density in the second phase to give us uh, higher assessed value, um, higher uh, opportunities for monetizing the reimbursables that we have from the bond proceeds. So we'll talk a little bit about how those reimbursables play in our business model and the opportunities for us on that. On the second phase, uh, we'll be breaking ground this month on that. We're actually in the, in the field uh, installing all of our improvements for the erosion control sediments and things like that. So uh, the big uh, the big equipment's looking to be on site uh, later this month and really moving a lot of the grading on that. But before we get that in there, we've got to put some of the BMPs for stormwater detention in there, and, and all that stuff is currently underway. So we, we are underway on that second phase. We've got contracts with uh, four uh, home builders on this next phase. So um, we'll be, as we finish out the first filing, the, you know, they'll finish out the last, components of the 506 lots uh, as we ramp up with the other 900 lots. So we're likely to have, for a period of time, six builders out there, and then we run out of inventory on the first phase and maintain that inventory in the second phase. Taking a look at kind of the scorecard for each of these, filing one, uh, we invested about $35.8 million, uh, received to date the $47.2 million in uh, lot revenues as well as about $10.5 million in reimbursables, so we did have one monetization of the reimbursables. And, and let me talk a little bit about what these reimbursables are. So what we do is we are installing the public improvements, and those public improvements range from roads, curbs, and gutters to drainage facilities, stormwater facilities, stormwater detention facilities, parks, open spaces, a whole portfolio of improvements. And the communities, Colorado, much like uh, many states, is sort of growth pays its own way. So each, each new project will have its own municipalities that have mill levies that they use to finance all those public improvements. And so as the community matures, you get that assessed value, which uh, aggregates the total value of all the homes and businesses that live in the community. And then the tax revenues, the property tax revenues from that are available for bond proceeds to go to reimburse the developer. In this first phase, we have a, a relatively high amount of that uh, upfront. If you look at those two reimbursable amounts, we're at about $31.6 million of the reimbursables from that first phase. And so we still have $21 million of reimbursables that we will get from that first phase. Um, we're working on how we account for that. Currently, you know, you can see that in our financial statements in the notes. Uh, because we do have a note with the municipality that carries with a time value money component on that that continues to grow on interest to allow us, you know, to, to be current on what the value of that is as we make those investments. And as the, as the community matures, there will be future bond offerings that will allow us to recover that $21 million. So that will be another component of our first phase. You know, we're, we're already in the black on that first phase with recovery of about uh, almost 30 or $48 million, and then another $21 million to come. Um, and then the second component of that, and this, this coupling of land and water development, uh, is the water utility component where we get the connection fees. Uh, we get about, five, about $15 million in connection fees. To date, we received about $10 million of that, so there's about another $5 million from the remaining lots that are still yet to be built in the filing one. Uh, and then kind of the cost component of that 35.8 that I mentioned earlier. If you take a look at that and contrast that to the other 900 lots, 895 lots, you know, we, we will see a little bit of increase in lot cost, but not much. We might see about a three, 
3.5% increase in lot costs. So, you know, we'll take a look at the next lots is about $72.6 million. Uh, we're estimating, and this is an estimate, the reimbursables here won't be as high as a percentage as they were in the first phase, just because we had some offsite improvements in the first phase. But, you know, taking a look at that $48.1 million, um, we'll receive those revenues as well. Uh, and then the TAP fees, we're projecting, you know, uh, we'll have uh, a, a variety of TAP fees because not all of the TAPs will be a whole TAP because there'll be kind of higher density, multifamily product out there and contrasting that against the $65 million in cost. So the lot sales, we had um, really about a 30% increase in lot revenues. So the cost of our lots, we were able, because of the success of our first filing, we were able to hold a price increase on that, and then we'll still maintain our margins on the reimbursables and the tap fees. That's a bit about how the second phase is going to roll forward. Uh, this is kind of uh, contrasting the, the remaining portion of the project. So if you take a look at this, um, filing one represented about 10% of the aggregate opportunity of the project, about 506 lots out of a total of 5,000 lots. We have plenty of pedal left in Sky Ranch, and when we look at the cumulative component of this, you know, between the lot revenues, the reimbursable revenues, and the TAP fee revenues, this is over a $500 million project for the company. So we are excited about continuing to grow this opportunity, to continue to value, improve this through how we're making the community, the value that we're putting into the infrastructure, and then how that's going to translate both in terms of water connections as well as uh, lot revenue. Uh, turning our attention a little bit to our water utility segment, what makes this whole thing work is water. Uh, our utility segment continues to grow by adding assets. So we're adding assets that we capitalize and depreciate off our balance sheet. And, you know, those are high value assets for the company that then we put into service and provide that customer service on an ongoing basis. And, you know, these customers are probably the, the, the stickiest of customers, right? These are going to be perpetual customers. You, you, uh, I know a lot of companies like to talk about how sticky their customers are, what their recurring revenues are going to be, but these customers really do last uh, in perpetuity. You have to have water for any value to an asset of this nature for a house or a home. Taking a look at kind of how that asset growth has occurred, we've had a 60% growth in our asset value, so that's the system that we continue to build and capitalize, and that's what we use to provide both water and wastewater service to our customers out at Sky Ranch. Uh, what we're looking at is really adding um, uh, most of the infrastructure for filing two is in place. All of the wastewater assets are in place with existing capacity. We might add a modest amount of water capacity to allow our operators to sleep at night to have a little bit of redundant facility, so we'll probably spend about $3 million to make sure that we have a, a second well that will be a backup well in the event that our first well goes down and we have storage and, and a number of duplicity to our system to make sure that we can sustain ourselves for several days without any, uh, with, with an outage or anything like that. So we have a, a little bit of duplicity in that. But the interesting thing about our second phase will be kind of the margins and how quickly our cap fee revenues accelerate and show that, um, that growth in our net income just because we've got the assets in place from the first phase. Looking to add another uh, five million in tap fees from filing one, uh, which will balance out the, the water and the wastewater tap fees from filing one, and then again moving into 2021, 2022 with tap fees starting for the second phase of this. So you'll see that continuing on, you know, we get two sources of revenue for that. We get the upfront fee, which are the tap fees, and then this ongoing customer. So this kind of shows you what our growth for our uh, customer bases are. And so, you know, we, we're up to about 650 connections today, and that continues to grow. This shows up through about 3,500 connections. We probably look a little bit stronger than that, I would project, given where our absorptions are today. But you know, certainly Sky Ranch by itself will be about 5,000 connections. So depending on a 10-year cycle, that could go between 650 up to 5,000 connections at build-out. So if we continue to maintain this pace, you know, we're going to 
see about those uh, continuing customer connections and that ongoing uh, revenue cycle for the company. Uh, Q1 accomplishments, you know, these are going to be sort of the statistics. Uh, you know, we continue to build our balance sheet, add uh, total assets, continue to add to the cash pill position of the company. You know, we, we're a very clean balance sheet. We have no debt. Uh, you know, we're strong cash balance as we roll into our second filing. And, and I know, you know, on our last couple of calls, I, I know there was a bunch of questions about, you know, what are we going to do with those cash positions? And, you know, at what point does the company look for other options, you know, whether they're strategic options on continuing to grow the business by acquisitions, which we do have our nets out for acquisitions on those. So we want to keep a little powder dry for some of those acquisitions, uh, as well as being able to use that cash to generate um, the, the next phase of this community. So we take the next 900 lots. We'll probably break that down into several sub-phases so that we don't put all that at risk at once. We want to make sure that, you know, we maintain some parity with our home builders in how they're purchasing those lots, and our home builders are paying us uh, concurrently as we develop that so that we minimize our risk and we also minimize their inventory. So there's a good partnership relationship uh, with our builders and how we monetize and how we uh, fund the public improvement investments from them. Taking a look at our balance sheet, you know, I'll let you guys sort of take a look at the balance sheet and the income statement so that uh, you can you can kind of see the results of what it is that we're doing on both of those. But tremendous results. You know, if you take a look at year over year, quarter over quarter results, we continue to, you know, post up some really good numbers. So uh, keep uh, an keep, uh, eye on how we continue to develop those assets. I want to talk a little bit about kind of uh, leadership within the company. So, you know, the company's grown fairly substantially over the last couple of years, and we've added, uh, you know, some key talent to some very key positions within the company. We've added uh, Kevin McNeil, uh, who's the vice president and CFO to our operations, and so he's come back to the company. He was our controller several years ago, but, um, you know, sort of advanced his career and, and really – fine-tune his skills as CFO with a couple of other companies. We're welcoming him back and, and certainly appreciate the contributions that he's making to help us grow the business, as well as kind of adding additional board members. So we've had two retiring board members this year, two of our longest-serving board members. Uh, Harry Auger and Dick Guido are both retiring this year after more than 25 years of service, and while we will miss them greatly, uh, we won't totally let them go. We're kind of always kind of maintain that contact with them, just to continue with the institutional knowledge, but we're also bringing in some other key position strengths in here. So we've added uh, three board positions over the last year. Uh, Jeff Sheets, who has a significant amount of commercial real estate experience here in the Denver area. We've added uh, Rick Fendel, who has retired, who was our water attorney uh, and, and retired after a more than 35 years of uh, being a water attorney here in the state of Colorado, so we're able to leverage his uh, his expertise not only with the company's assets, but also his expertise in general to help us uh, continue to navigate how we own water, how much water we own, what type of water we own, where we own it, uh, as well as uh, Dan Kozlowski, who's uh, an institutional investor, and it really brings a, a, a new, uh, fresh uh, perspective on how institutional investors look at companies, you know, what their metrics are, how we communicate with them, how we continue to build that investor relation program. So very excited about the transition and kind of the, uh, the growth of our, our leadership and our, 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 our real brain trust within the company. A couple of other metrics, you know, these are going to be, when, you know, Charts that, that you're all accustomed to seeing, both revenue, gross margin, net income, EBITDA, these are very, you know, just terrific uh, growth charts when you see year over year from 2016 up to current 2020. So I'll let you study and, and, and analyze those. But we're really, uh, we're really excited about kind of the continued monetization of both our land interests and as well as our water interests. I think our slide, final slide is going to be stock price. Uh, you know, uh, stock price is improving. And so, you know, we, we did see um, some weakness in the stock through, the, through 2020, and we're all glad that 2020 is behind us. Uh, and I think that, you know, if we're looking at 
2021 and a fresh start. The, the last couple of days have been a great start for us. So we'll hope to keep that momentum and, and really start to be able to demonstrate not only to you, our longstanding shareholders, but also people new to the company, of really the value of these assets and how they've grown and how the company has really built around monetizing these assets. Um, you know, what we'd like to do is continue to get the word out, and, and I'm going to try and leverage some of our existing shareholders. So to the extent that you have referrals or somebody who might be interested in a company that has high value, that's asset rich, that's an inflation protection, and that's high margin business and debt free and, you know, uh, an undervalued company, send them our way. It's something that I think we can uh, give them a story and I think uh, impress them about what it is that we put together and, and how we might want to monetize this. So with that, I might turn it back over to the moderator and see if uh, you all have any questions that I might be able to provide a little bit of additional color on. So with that, I'll take it back to you, Omar. All right, perfect. And um, at this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. And uh, for participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Uh, so one moment, please, while we poll for questions. And our first question comes from John Rosenberg with Lawland Water Partners. You may state your question, John. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I hope this finds you well, and thank you for taking my question. You bet. Um, anyway, uh, Mark, I asked you this before. I just kind of, I'm just trying to better understand. Um, uh, you, you're, you're obviously expensing a lot of the build-out of your system. You mentioned uh, in your remarks about some greater uh, contribution margin coming through as you go into phase two, as a lot of your system has been built out. Could you provide some more color on that as to what we might expect in terms of actual uh, gross profits from the water utility and, um, and wastewater utility operations? Um, sure. So when we took a look at that first segment, uh, 506 lots, we had, uh, if you took a look at the TAP fees, and the TAP fees, you know, one single family equivalent TAP uh, is really roughly translate to about 0.4 acre feet of water a year. And, and that cost of that TAP, I think our current TAP fees are right around 27,000 in that, you know, 27 and some change. And so when you take a look at 506 lots and our forecast for those, that was going to generate about $15 million uh, in total water, wastewater tap fee revenue. And the facilities that we spent on that were right around, I'm going to say around $13 million. So we spent about $10 million on our, our water reclamation, our wastewater treatment plant, which really takes water mm -hmm. all the way back to a reuse potential and then another $3 million in water system improvements. And so what that will translate to into the second phase is we are going to look to receive around $23 million in water and wastewater tap fee revenues with a $3 million additional investment. So you're looking at kind of that spread of how much, how much cost do we have to incur, incur to get that $22 million given the fact that we've made that front-end investment on the phase one. So that'll give you a bit of a margin on how the CapEx looks on our utility segment from phase one to phase two and where those revenue differentials and what our investments are looking like on that. Okay, I see. So I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just not quite understanding. Like, I, I, I can see, um, I, I understand that there'll be improvements, but yep. um, for example, uh, uh, the the operating income of let's say in a typical water utility is somewhere like around 30 percent. Is that kind right. of what you guys are gunning for in, on an operating basis? Yeah, I, I would say that's true. So when we get that $1,500 per connection per year, that's what I would call that operating revenue margin. 
I would say our operating margins are going to be right in that range, maybe a little bit better. You know, I think we have, uh, you know, pretty efficient shop where we're going to continue to run most of our systems on an automated fashion, and, and technology does leverage yourself here. So, you know, what we think we'll have, uh, the supplies that we have, you know, we have very clean water on the front end, so we have a minimal amount of treatment that we have to do that water supply on the front end, and then, you know, wastewater reclamation, those, those margins are a little bit thinner, uh, so we'll have probably higher margins on the water side and, and sort of lower margins on the wastewater side. When you take a look at combined water and wastewater margins on the operating side of it, it it's probably closer to 40% margins, so slightly better than what you'd see in the utility industry as a whole. Okay, great, but you don't, but towards that end, you don't expect to see like a huge step up for that segment in SGNA or anything like that. No, you no, are you are no. you are sort of you're costing your revenue. You're costing your base right now. We in are in terms of we putting are. in the We're equipment. We're adequately sized. That's right. We are but, adequately But you don't sized. need to. Okay, great. All right. Well, uh, happy New Year, um, and thank you very much for taking my question. You I look happy forward to hearing more. You. Thanks. Yep. I did get a question uh, texted over to us about oil and gas. I, I neglected not to mention. I did not neglected not to mention. I neglected to mention that we do sell water to the oil and gas industry. Um, that's been a very light component over the last year, mostly because of the demand for oil and gas. In Q1 of this year, we did do a frac uh, for our our largest operator in the field. Uh, and, and really kind of a four-well frack. So they had a pad site that was drilled previously, and then they did frack one of those pad sites. Uh, I think we did a, about a million one, million two in water sales for that frack during Q1. No guidance uh, for that oil and gas industry. You know, we sort of look at that as sort of an optionality into the company. We like it when it's there because it's, uh, it's good business. It's high margin business. and. You know, we can dial our systems up and we can dial our systems down so that we don't incur pent-up demand or unrealized costs attributable to that industry and, and have the ability to kind of serve them when it's there and then, you know, not when that demand softens. So, you know, we'll wait to see and, you know, as we get further guidance, we'll update you from uh, the oil and gas operators in the field. You know, we, we may or may not see a rig out there this year. Uh, there's still some wells that might still need yet to be fracked from operators, but we'll see uh, how that guidance goes over time. All right, it appears we have uh, no further questions by phone. Uh, if you have any closing remarks, uh, Mr. Harding. You bet. Uh, so what I what I do is, you know, we will continue to uh, really improve our investor outreach. So one of the things we're going to try to do is uh, be a little bit more proactive. You'll see some updates to our website. You'll see some updates to social media and making sure that we're getting our information out. We're linking to, you know, what we're doing on a more timely basis so that it's not just a quarter over quarter update. Certainly we will do the quarter over quarter updates. We want to make sure that you guys get that information. You get it disseminated correctly so that you have the opportunity to kind of understand how we're executing on these phases, and then also, you know, what's going on in between those phases so that you know, you know, what those important metrics are and, you know, how you can evaluate the acceleration and the growth potential for the company uh, to the extent that you've got others that are interested and, you know, forward those contacts. We'll certainly reach out to them, you know, forward them opportunities and information on our website. There's a ton of information there. We'll continue to add more information there with these types of presentations as well as uh, other metrics on there where we can get more video presentations and kind of a walkthrough of how we're progressing with uh, the development activity on a more progressive update rather than quarterly calls. Uh, if, you, if your technology didn't work and you wanted to ask a question but didn't get an opportunity to do that, don't hesitate to give me a call. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And, I want to thank you for your continued support and look forward to uh, working with you in the future. Oh, perfect. Uh, this concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.